Hello everyone, welcome back. In this section we're going to talk about what are called the limit laws. Um, the limit laws in this section is kind of helping us build up our basis for approaching limits algebraically. Although the laws we discuss are going to be uh, applicable whether the limit is um, done algebraically, numerically, or graphically. So a little bit of setup before we start describing these limit laws and how to use them. Uh, it's in this note up here. Uh, in the statement of all these limit laws, we're going to suppose that C is representing some uh, constant real number. We're also going to suppose that the limit as x approaches A of our function f, as well as the limit as x approaches A of our function g exists. So they both exist as some real finite number. And another final note is um, we're writing all these limit laws up for two-sided limits, but they're going to apply to our one-sided limits as well. And eventually when we talk about limits involving infinity, they'll apply there too. So let's go ahead and get started. So the, uh, the first of our limit laws is called the sum indifference limit law. Um, to read it, it says the limit as x approaches a of f of x plus g of x, so the sum of two functions, or we could also write it as the limit uh, as x approaches a of f of x minus g of x, the difference of two functions, can be rewritten as the limit as x approaches a of f of x, the first function, uh, plus the limit as x approaches a of g of x, our second function, um, or we could take the difference between those two limits. What this limit law is saying and what really what all these limit laws are saying and what they're used for is uh, we're allowed to basically take a limit of a complicated function or expression and break it up into some simpler, smaller pieces, find the limit of each of those smaller pieces, and then put it uh, back together. So the constant multiple law, number two here in our table or list, says the limit as x approaches a of a constant times a function is equivalent to the constant times the limit of the function. So this one says we're allowed to kind of pull constants uh, out of our limits, or if we wanted to, we could also bring a constant inside of our limit. The next limit law is called the product law, and it deals with taking the limit of a product of two functions. So it says the limit as x approaches a of a product of f with g can be written as the limit of the first factor in the product times the limit of the second factor in our product. Again, just kind of treating it piece by piece and then putting those pieces back together, this time through multiplication instead of maybe like addition and subtraction as we saw in the sum and difference rule. So number four on our list is the quotient law for limits. It says uh, the limit as x approaches a of f divided by g can be approached by taking the limit of the numerator and dividing that by the limit of the denominator. There's one uh, extra little condition that we have with this one that didn't show up in our original notes, and that's that the uh, denominator can't have the limit uh, approach zero because we don't want to divide by zero. So we are going to have a few more limit laws besides uh, these five. This is just to get us started. But the last one we have on the board for now is what is called the, the power law for limits. It says if you're taking the limit as x approaches a of some function raised to some power, well, you can kind of pass the limit inside of that power take the limit of the function and then raise it to that power. Um, and that's of course provided that that limit exists as a real number. So what that kind of means is if our function approaches a negative value while our power is a, a fractional exponent like one half, that uh, we could rewrite that as like the square root of a negative and that's what we want to avoid here. We don't want to take the square root of a negative or anything like that. One other thing to point out with the power law is that that exponent n can really be any real number. If it's a whole number or an integer like one, two, three, or four, then it's just like your function raised to the first power, squared, cubed, uh, to the fourth power, and so on. But if it's a fractional exponent like one half, one third, or one fourth, well then it's like taking the square root, cube root, or fourth root. So this power law is gonna be really helpful when we uh, take limits of those root functions. So one last thing to finish uh, our discussion of these limit laws off is a little bit of a brief justification for these limit laws. We're going to go through all five of them and justify them all. I want to focus really on the first two, the sum and difference limit law and the constant multiple law and why we can kind of take them at face value or believe that they are true. And this all really goes back to um, really I, th I think the graphical approach to finding these limits or thinking about limits and also goes but ties in with uh, how we kind of graph the uh, sum and difference of two functions or a constant multiple of a function, right? So if we think about graphing the function f of x compared to the graph of c times f of x, 
that factor of C is just going to potentially vertically stretch, compress, and maybe flip our function. Well, that's going to uh, affect its outputs by vertically stretching, compressing, or flipping the outputs. And well, when we take the limit, we're looking at what happens to the outputs of our function as x gets closer to A, or whatever our limit value is. So if all of our outputs are getting stretched by C, it makes sense that the limit would get stretched by C as well. That's really the justification for all these. In the sum and difference law, we're like adding and subtracting outputs. So the limits are going to be added and subtracted just like the outputs are. In the product law, we're multiplying the outputs and so on with the quotient and power law. So that's a, a little bit of a reasoning why we can um, believe these are true. So in this example, and actually in the next couple examples, we're going to use the, uh, the graphs of the functions f and g provided here to evaluate the given limit. And so the first limit I want us to look at is the limit as x approaches 3 of the function f of x squared. Then we subtract away from f of x squared uh, 2 times uh, g of x. So in order to evaluate this function, we're going to have to break it into these smaller pieces using our limit laws. So let's go ahead and break it down. All right, so I went ahead and applied our limit laws to our, our limit of interest. Let me go ahead and explain exactly how I did it. So remember, our original limit was the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x squared minus 2 times g of x. Um, so you can kind of do this in a couple different combinations, but let me go ahead and explain it one way. Uh, first, maybe we think about splitting our two terms up inside of our limit uh, into two limits. So this would be like the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x squared minus the limit as x approaches 3 of 2 times g of x. We're going to kind of do lots of steps in uh, one here just to save some time. So with that first piece, we could then apply the power law to uh, take that exponent of 2 and bring it outside of our limit. And so now we can use the graph of f to actually find the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x. Whatever that value happens to be, if it exists, we square it, and that gives us that first piece in our limit of interest. For our second piece, well, we created the second piece by using that difference rule as our, our difference law. Um, we then also combine that with our constant multiple limit law that allows us to bring that constant factor of 2 outside of our limit. And so now it's broken down into basically as simple of a piece as we can make it. Uh, negative 2 times the limit as x approaches 3 of g of x. Now we can go to our graph over here and attempt to actually find that limit. Now to find our limits graphically, we just have to make sure that we uh, track the output of our function as the inputs get closer and closer to x equals 3. And remember, this is a two-sided limit, so we have to approach the same value uh, no matter if we approach x equals 3 from the left or from the right. So let's start by looking at what happens to our function f as its input gets closer and closer to 3. So in orange is our function f over here. We can see it's kind of a, a strange piecewise function. It's constant on this far left interval, kind of goes up and down with some discontinuities throughout the rest of its domain. Let's see. When we get closer and closer to x equals 3, it looks like we have this hole in our function, but the limit doesn't care about what actually happens at x equals 3. The limit only cares about what happens really, really close by. And really, really close to x equals 3, no matter which side we kind of go at it from, it looks like the output of our function is always getting closer and closer to negative 1. Even though our function is defined to be 0 at x equals 3, uh, the limit is going to be negative 1. Remember, the limit doesn't care about what is happening at the point, just what happens really, really close by. OK, so we can do the exact same thing for our function g. It's our green function graphed over here. Let's see, what's the function g doing as x gets closer and closer to 3? Well, it looks like on that interval containing x equals 3, our function g is constant. Its output is always 3. So as we get closer and closer to x equals 3, g is already 3, but that still means it's getting closer and closer to 3. So now that we found the limit of f and the limit of g as x approaches 3, we can square the limit of f and subtract away from that 2 times the limit of g, and that will give us the limit of our original function, f squared minus 2 times g. Let's see, negative 1 squared is positive 1. Negative 2 times 3 is negative 6. So 1 minus 6 is negative 5. And that is the value of our limit. We found this limit using our algebraic limit laws. Um, really much faster and efficient than if we were to actually try to 
use the graph of f and g and create the graph of this gross function up here, f squared minus 2 times g of x. That would take a long time to figure out what that graph looks like and even longer to find the limit. So it's a good thing we had our algebraic approach with these limit laws. So in our next example, we're going to be using the, uh, the same functions, f and g, and their graphs as in the previous example. This time, though, I want us to investigate uh, the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x plus g of x. And we can jump in right away and try to uh, figure out which of our limit laws applies here. And well, if we look at the function of interest, it's f plus g. So we're going to want to use that, that sum rule for limits to uh, split this up as the limit of f plus the limit of g. So that'll be our first step. So this is the same thing as the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x. And we can add to that the limit as x approaches negative 2 of g of x. Just like before, we can refer to the graph to try to find these individual limits. Let's go ahead and start with our function f in orange here. And remember, we're looking at how our outputs behave as x approaches negative 2. And this is one of our two-sided limits, no uh, plus or minus sign in the exponent or superscript. So we have to take both sides into account. And that's where the, it looks like an issue is going to arise in this example. As uh, the function in orange f approaches negative 2 from the left, it looks like the outputs are negative 1. So that makes the limit appear to be negative 1. But if we approach x equals negative 2 from the right-hand side, from the other side, we can see our function f is getting closer and closer to 0. So the two-sided limit of our function f does not exist. And now we could go ahead and figure out what happens to the limit as x approaches negative 2 of g of x, but it doesn't matter because as soon as one piece does not exist or kind of fails, the whole bet's off and we'd say that this entire limit does not exist. It only has to fail at one uh, piece of it. And that piece happened to be the first one. So here we would say the two-sided limit does not exist, but maybe we're interested in the one-sided limit. So let's go ahead and take a look at those next. All right, so I've changed our last example ever so slightly. Notice now we have a plus in our exponent or superscript, and so now that, that is indicating a one-sided limit, indicating a right-sided limit. So we're still going to figure out what's happening to the sum of the outputs of these two functions, but now only as x approaches negative 2 from the right or from above. And just like before, we start by breaking it up into the pieces or components. The first one being the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right of our function f. Then we're going to add to that the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right of our function g. Let's see. The two-sided limit for f did not exist in our previous example. But let's see if the one-sided limits do. So we're getting closer and closer to negative 2, but not from both sides, only from the right-hand side. And we can see the outputs of our function are getting closer and closer to 0 as the inputs, or as x, gets closer to negative 2 from the right-hand side. So now the first term in our limit is 0. We have to add to that whatever happens to g as x approaches negative 2 from the right. So when we look at our function g in green over here at x equals negative 2, it looks like the two-side limit does actually exist here because both sides are converging or getting closer and closer to the same output. Um, but we're just interested in the right-handed limit. And so let's see. As x gets closer and closer to negative 2 from the right-hand side, the output of our function g looks like it's getting closer and closer to positive 2. So now each of our terms and their limits existed. So now we can find the original limit just by adding the two limits together. And that gives us 0 plus 2 is 2. We looked at the, uh, the right-handed limit for this uh, example. What's going to happen when we look at the left-handed limit? Will it be the same or will it be different? I'll go ahead and let you try to figure that one out. 